Desde arriba la ciudad parece un juego de cajas chinas. Desde abajo se vuelve desprolija y casual. Todo depende de los puntos de vista. Dice el caracol que el primero de los 26 vive en Nueva York. Estoy ahora en Nueva York a regañadientes, buscando a alguien que no sé quién es. Brokers de Wall Street, vendedoras de Macy's, chicas vestidas en Gap y desamparados que se cruzan sin que nadie los vea. Todos se levantan pensando que hoy será el día en el que la vida se dé vuelta como un cubilete. Y no sucede, pero al día siguiente vuelven a soñar. Carter Emmerich camina hacia el destino con una taza de café en la mano. Una sola cuadra separa a su casa del borde del universo. Las grandes historias comienzan a veces con pequeños detalles. Carter pensó que dibujar el universo sería una manera de comenzar a entenderlo. Y aquí hizo el primer trazo de una línea que llegó al infinito. En un bar llamado Earth Matters, la Tierra Importa. Exciting and worrying in equal measure. What we are certain about is now. We can't even be certain about tomorrow. It's not what is to be done, but the question who is going to do it. No solo estamos hechos de sueños, de ambición o deseos. Estamos hechos de miedo, de perplejidad, de asombro y sorpresa. Estamos hechos de recuerdos y de futuros imaginarios y de preguntas. Pero antes, mucho antes que todo eso, estamos hechos de partículas, de pequeños universos que todavía no entendemos. Alguna vez nacimos, el universo nació. Y entonces, después del Big Bang, Solo había átomos de hidrógeno, la materia que hizo a las estrellas. El fuego quemó el hidrógeno transformándolo en helio y el helio luego se transformó en carbono. El carbono y el helio crearon al oxígeno. De los mismos elementos nació el silicio, el oro, el uranio. Nuestro planeta y nosotros mismos Estamos formados de materia de estrellas.
Somos polvo de estrellas, decía Carl Sagan. Polvo somos y en polvo nos convertiremos, dice la Biblia. ¿Y si somos eso? ¿Si al morir nos convertimos en luz? Hay miles de millones de estrellas. Hay un orden que nos vincula. Carlton Emmert, el cartógrafo, dibujó ese camino. Hizo el primer mapa 3D del universo. El Atlas de Emmert llevó 12 años de trabajo. Comprende casi un millón de galaxias y más de 120.000 cuasas. El viaje comienza en el Himalaya y termina a 13.700 millones de años luz de distancia. Yes, and in fact, uh, a deep philosophical sense of what and who we are. We need, and we have no other choice than to take care of what is here. And we need people to realize that. And I think seeing the Earth from space as an experiential aspect is, is very fundamental to that, that you see it in motion, you see it change over time. A map of the Earth is delivered every day by two satellites. So there are two maps delivered every day of the Earth at the resolution one would see, basically, from orbit. We live at a time when we can put together this information thanks to machines, thanks to computing, unlike ever before. We've been very privileged to put together from the NASA information, the mapping of other worlds, uh, the, uh, the star database, and all these, these international groupings of science to put this thing together. In the end, it becomes an almost meditation on our existence. And, and that, that is, again, that's a very fundamental aspect of, of, of sort of knowing what and who we are. Domo es un inmenso cubo de vidrio que se transforma en una especie de nave espacial. Se llama en realidad el Hayden Space Theater. Y allí Emmert proyecta el Atlas 3D del universo. El viaje es azul. Todos flotan en su sitio y el tiempo ya no produce angustia alguna. Viajo en el aire como podría flotar en el agua. Leve, en paz, absorto. entiendo por primera vez a Jeffrey Hoffman, uno de los mejores astronautas de la historia, el día que recordó cerrando los ojos. My very first flight 
right when the engines cut off and I floated over to the window and I looked out and we were going over the coast of Africa and I realized for the first time that I was in space and <laughs> I remember then looking in the mirror and I was smiling so much I you know I, I couldn't stop smiling for hours I was so excited I remember looking at night over the top of thunderclouds and seeing the lightning playing around it's a, it's an extraordinary light show you know better than the best fireworks display that I've ever seen but Space is the blackest black that you can imagine. Uh, it's darker than the darkest night on Earth. Jeffrey Hoffman voló cinco veces al espacio, más de 1.200 horas en la noche más negra que podía imaginar. Hoy es profesor del Departamento de Aeronáutica y Astronáutica del MIT. We know almost nothing about the universe, <laughs> but the things that we do know are just really extraordinarily interesting. And for instance, without stars before us, before the formation of the earth, there would be no life. The calcium in our bones, the iron in your blood, all of that was made in stars. And so we're all connected together. We're connected up with the history of all of the stars that were formed and died before uh, we came about. And there, there's plenty more to find out. We, just, we, we only know a little bit about what's going on, but what we do know is, has turned out to be very interesting. Astronomy is about human knowledge and understanding of where we are, where we came from, and maybe even where we're going into the future. We can understand the evolution of our own planet, for example, uh, in the context of the star that it, it, it orbits. Uh, but also, where did that come from? It wasn't always here. <laughs> In fact, we are all made up of material that has been cycled through many stars. You know, all of this stuff, uh, you know, my ring, my skin, my jacket, all these, all these atoms were in stars once before, <laughs> billions of years ago. So we're inherently connected. There is no question about it. And to understand that, I think, makes the world a better place. I think there's no question about that. Everything depends on everything else, especially everything that depends on what happened before. And that's what we've come to learn in the last few decades. Um, so, for instance, without um, elements like carbon and iron and silicon, there would be no planets. There would be no solid planets like our own. There might not be any planets at all. But all of those elements that I just mentioned were made in, in, in stars that came before us. And so the, the, the history of the universe becomes more connected as we learn more about it, not less connected. There are times when I go in the dome by myself at night and you look at a plotting. We show dots for galaxies, stars. It's a tremendous amount of things to take in. In a way, almost speak to you because what you're looking at is so much larger than yourself. You're looking at something that is the recognition of our surroundings and our origins. It's what we are, it's what makes up our bodies. It's stars, galaxies filled with stars, stars orbited by planets. And only one planet we know in the entire universe with life.
have no other choice than to take care of what is here. Without stars, there will be no life. Astronomy is about understanding where we are, where we came from, and maybe even where we're going into the future. We're all connected together. We're connected up with the history of all of the stars that were formed and died before we came about. This was the dome, right. around probably around 1933 or 34. The original Hayden opened in 1935, mm -hmm. and then once uh, nearing completion, mm -hmm. was what the old Hayden Planetarium looked like. Mm -hmm. The idea in rebuilding the planetarium was that we go from not just the stars on the ceiling, which was fantastical. You recreate day and night, yeah. show the constellations. But we now know the three-dimensional distances to stars, galaxies, and that that knowledge and the planned science, surveys, satellites, new observatories, would be getting more and more distance information, a 3D universe. So the notion was, can we actually build within this, this new idea, not just in domes like you saw, but to flat screens, to... Um, to classrooms all around the world network together and so that we understand the universe together. I met Carter in 1981 at a conference of those of us who were crazy enough to think that people could go to Mars soon. And Carter was, uh, I think he was a geography student, but his real talent was in illustration. He would take the ideas that we were trying to form in our heads and trying to speak to each other back and forth in a small group and he would turn them into, well, is this what the Mars lander would look like? Well, no, it's a, it's a little narrower. It's a, the, change the base and you, the propellant tanks need to be larger. And, and in five minutes, he'd draw that. And, and, and we'd all, our eyes would pop out. And so we had something to show each other and to show people on the outside. And, and it was Carter who had this passion for taking a, a highly technical subject that, that was often out of reach of people who weren't trained in it and turning it into something that anyone could understand. My fantasy to start with making models as a child mm -hmm. and to sort of understand the reality of, of say how an airplane works or a spaceship to so then I built architectural models for several years uh, professionally out of college to then visualize and put together a model or a depiction of the universe that's accurate from Earth all the way out has been the greatest joy of my life. 
um, it is a task that will never be fully completed. I met Carter about 10 years ago when I joined the museum, um, but I met him because he was putting together what I thought was an absolutely fantastic project, which was to essentially build a model of the universe. Um, it's not so much, it, it's almost denigrating to call it a map, it's really a model. It's, uh, it's a three-dimensional representation of um, what we know of the universe and where we are in it. He really feels that he has a very important role uh, in getting the word out there of what we know about astronomy. And he's absolutely right, and, and it has a huge impact. We get five million people a year coming through to see his shows. turn on that's that's where we are and you'll see the stars start to come out so many stars they really just become a fog and as we pull out the Milky Way galaxy comes together we'll see the bulbs of the Milky Way here and as we come out farther the other galaxies come on We're loading a, a deeper data set that is about a million galaxies, and we're going to add another million. You'll see them fading up in, in fan-like shapes. You may notice that this is in two. That's because our galaxy is in, is in this orientation, and it blocks our view. So what is home? Is home the Milky Way galaxy of several hundred billion stars? Is home the sun? I spent 20 years at NASA as an astronaut, and I flew five times on the space shuttle. Uh, I was the first astronaut actually to log 1,000 hours on the space shuttle, and I made four spacewalks. And probably the, the biggest thrill for me was, as both as an astronomer and an astronaut, I got to be on the initial mission to rescue and repair the Hubble Space Telescope. When it came time for my first mission, and I actually, you know, rode out to the launch pad and got in, climbed up in the shuttle, and and was strapped into my uh, seat, I realized, you know, people would continue to ask me, you know, "Aren't you afraid? Isn't this dangerous?" What I realized was. That's not the time to start wondering about, do I really want to do this? I mean, I had dreamed about doing it since I was six years old, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy the ride, because I'd waited for, you know, at that point I'd been waiting for 35 years to fly in space. And it didn't disappoint, I'll tell you. Within less than two minutes, the blue sky is gone, and you're looking out the window at the blackness of space. And then the engines shut down and, and all of a sudden the world changes because you have no weight. If you just float motionless and you, you work to get all of your muscles totally relaxed, which is not always easy because you, you sometimes you're tense, but I found if my muscles were totally relaxed and I, and I was just in a state of particularly at at night I could close my eyes and it's almost like going into a trance like a deep meditation but it's a physical meditation because you almost lose 
the sense of having a body because you have no sensory input. Gravity is not pulling on you. Everything is just floating completely free. And, and it's like being almost a suspended consciousness without any physical body, which I found very pleasant. Of all the things that I miss about being in space, that's the one that I wish I could get back, but I can't bring back the feeling of weightlessness. I wish I could. I also feel that born in 1961, it was the same year that uh, humans first flew mm -hmm. uh, in space. And that uh, to be eight years old, uh, when we walked on the moon, I was old enough to understand it, and I was young enough to be completely mm -hmm. captured by that. And, um, and as I say, I'm honored to have found uh, a place here at a place where our job is to try to put together you know, the, the diorama of the universe, if you will. Mm -hmm. de piezas y medidas de París se balancea el péndulo de Foucault. Fue creado en 1800 para demostrar la rotación de la Tierra y cambió el punto de vista sobre el universo. Aquí el mundo guarda todo lo que puede medirse. Mapas, relojes, globos, el metro patrón, inalterable, el metro que le dice a los demás metros del mundo cuánto deben medir exactamente manotazos de ahogado del hombre frente a la angustia del infinito. I used to lay awake at night as a child, as many children do, when you confront the idea of the infinity of space and time. Mm -hmm. And the universe, we see a, a limitation in time because light travels at a fixed speed and the farther out we look, the further back in time we see. So we look far enough, you see the beginning, so the beginning of the clock, but that what we see in that sample that's limited by time is a universe that may well be infinite but that had a beginning It's, if you imagine you started counting and there was the biggest number you could get to after one day and if you kept counting for years you would get to bigger and bigger numbers and if you imagine all the people in the earth kept this counting up for all time they would ne there would always be a bigger number to get to and so infinity is not the biggest number possible because that's not what it means it just means that there's no possibility of getting to the end of counting no matter how much time you have, no matter, no matter how many people are involved, or how big your computers are, you can never get to the end of counting. That's what infinity means. Mm -hmm. 
We don't know if the universe is infinite or not. We do know that it's not infinitely old. Right? We've good reason to believe it's about 14 billion years old, a little less than 14 billion years old. And that by itself is a very important discovery that's been made in our lifetimes. Um, but whether it extends away from us, we have no idea how far it goes. science fiction and science writer and uh, great communicator of science. He used to like to say that, you know, if the universe didn't have life, it would be an awful waste of space. <laughs> As we have more and more people, that becomes something that we need to understand. And I don't know how to do that, but the more that we can show that perspective, I think, of the universe, where we come from, from the beginning of the clock, a perhaps infinite universe, that we can gain a respect for ourselves and all the others that are ourselves on this planet, which is home, this star, which is home, this galaxy, this universe, which is home. We haven't one shred of information that shows there's life anywhere else. I think it's reasonably likely that that situation, that fundamental lack of knowledge that we've had for our entire history, could change within the next few decades. Now we have hundreds of those planets around other stars. And in the next 10 or 20 years, we'll start pursuing the possibility of life on some of those planets. So we're trying to find out which are the most promising um, planets to study, and then we'll look for evidence of water or oxygen in, in the atmospheres of these planets and we'll pursue life in, 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 in the environments of other planets. And that way we'll learn a lot more about how life comes about, um, how common is it. But most of the space in between is extremely hostile to life. So if you take the results of, of NASA's Kepler satellite recently released that show there may be tens of billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And there are then, as Carl Sagan used to like to say, you know, billions and billions of galaxies from there. There's lots of oxygen to be detected in other places, but it's not a concentration of diatomic oxygen, of O2, that's what we breathe that keeps us, that if we're deprived of it, for more than a minute or two, we're dead. And, and yet our whole, our whole ecosystem produces this on a planetary scale, and if that's going on elsewhere, we'll soon be able to detect that. is life. We know that by studying the universe, the far, as far away as we look with our telescopes, we can determine that the laws of physics and chemistry seem to be pretty much the same all over the universe. And this maybe does re re reflect on the idea of, of infinity, is the sense of hostility to life in the universe. I mean, knowing that without our spacesuits or our spacecraft, 
we would be dead in 15 seconds, uh, you realize most of the universe is extraordinarily hostile to life, human or otherwise. And so having a planet like the Earth is, is very special. The Earth is our only planet. And we, we really have to look after it. don't have any choice but to make this home of ours a manageable, sustainable space, not just for humans, but for the life that sustains us and that we need to respect. Respecting them is as much as, as respecting ourselves, because it really is ourselves. And it's also a reminder that that this very special aspect of understanding the universe, at least here, maybe every, maybe in all these other places. But we are our own worst enemy. We take other humans, we turn them into slaves. We have problems in just educating people. We divide ourselves with spirituality. We need each other to survive, and we need each other to understand. And that's a process, that's a goal that we need to move toward. miedo a las cosas que no podemos imaginar capaz por eso la oscuridad potencia el miedo porque encontramos ahí cosas que no que no podemos imaginar fíjate esta ceniza imagínate por un segundo que nosotros somos esa ceniza que está ahí y que esto que está a nuestro alrededor es esta ciudad este bar este continente este mundo, el mundo es esto que está acá, el cenicero, y nosotros somos esta ceniza de acá. Y entonces, ¿cómo podría esta ceniza, pequeñita, chiquita, en el medio de este cenicero mundo, combatir, cambiar, o modificar, o tratar de que sea distinta esta lámpara, que nunca vio que no sabe quién la prende o quién la paga, frente a qué cosas es vulnerable, a qué le teme o a qué no. Y me pasa cada vez que me encuentro con un cenicero, pienso que soy la ceniza y que entonces todo, o por lo menos gran parte de todo, se reduce a nuestro punto de vista. Somos tan grandes como los enemigos que podamos imaginar como los que podemos imaginar y podemos combatir. Certain astronauts had a profound sense of almost purpose in the universe. Um, It, when you start to discuss these things, you're bordering on a very philosophical, perhaps um, spiritual level, because from their perspective, the Earth was clearly a singular unit, and the divisions were arbitrary amongst ourselves. The sense of scale is, is not so much when you're looking out, but when you turn around and look back at the Earth, and you, you really get the sense of the Earth as a planet, because when you look at the horizon, 
there's just a very thin little blue line, which is which is the atmosphere. You know, you go out on a on a clear day, and the blue sky looks so big, but when you really look at it from space, it's very very small, very thin. Of course, one of the things that you see from space is the effect that humans have had on our planet. During the course of, of my five space flights over, over 11 years, uh, just in that short time, I, I could see the increase in, for instance, the clear cutting of the Amazon jungle and uh, silting up of harbors, the uh, deforestation in Africa. Uh, the the pollution over large parts of China and and big cities throughout the world it's pretty scary I mean you see the impacts that humanity has had on our planet from a cosmic perspective and it really makes you understand that uh, the earth is is a finite planet humanity is no longer a, a negligible influence on our planet and it Right now, it's all we have, and so we better take care of it. Is it worth flying off to another Earth to bring our problems? Is it worth going to the moon to put up a Hilton hotel? Or is it, you know, or should we stay here on a perfectly adequate planet, the planet that we are part of, that is in us, that is us, and it's a perfectly adequate planet on, around a perfectly adequate star, around a per, in a perfectly adequate galaxy. Why spend all the energy to go somewhere else to find ourselves again? It might help save the world. Um, of course, one of the great challenges we're facing now is what are we actually doing to the planet as a whole planet? And so instead of thinking about this river or perhaps that forest, we're now thinking about the whole planet. Is it warming up too much? Are we contributing to this warming? And at the moment, we only have one planet to study. And it, it's, it's, it limits our ability to think about the problem. But now we have the possibility of studying possibly hundreds of other planets. We don't have the tools yet to, to study them. We haven't made much progress. But I think the study of other planets which are like ours, but maybe a little bit different, will help us understand our own Earth a lot better. It isn't just us and the rest of the universe. We are part of the universe. It's our backyard, if you will. And there are many things that influence life here that we've kind of taken for granted, the, the steady output of the sun, for example, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, cosmic rays may play a role in some of the early chemical processes that, that led to life. Uh, all kinds of connections, some of which are, have begun to be established, some of which are only conjecture at this point. Um, and that understanding those has, I think we have a, a much more accurate understanding of the complexity of the balance of the system that we live in. If we ignore the information, we do that at, at great peril. To me, that knowledge is critical for people to put aside some of their, their um, worries, the things that they daily worry about. Um, and and the problems and actually think in a much bigger sense where am I and who am I um, so from that point of view yes I think it absolutely could save the world in a sense um, uh, you know we're not going to cure uh, diseases like biologists do but knowledge is is as important as curing diseases there's so many beautiful things about the earth and the 
the longer you look at it, you keep discovering new things. There was, there was never a single day that I was in space when I didn't get excited when I woke up that, gee, I'm in space. This is, this is, this is great. I'm just having such a wonderful time. And, of course, we had to work, but we, uh, we, we had some time to relax and look out the window, and, and those are moments I'll never forget. We react to the browns of the desert and the greens of, of vegetation and the blue of the sky and, and the clouds. When you go into space, the sky is below you. It's not above you, it's below you. And it's encased in this ball, like a crystal ball. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful because we're tuned to what that beauty is. I mean, we've evolved within the sense of what the beauty is. The sun shines through it. It's brilliant sunlight. There is no day and night in space. It's always day. The sun has been glowing there, illuminating the solar system for five billion years. It will last another five billion years. Our salvation is on this planet. No sé si seremos luz que viaja a la luz, pero esa idea me tranquiliza. Somos niños al borde del mar, contemplando una inmensidad que no entendemos, pero intuimos familiar. El mundo azul ahora se duerme, para despertarse azul mañana. Cáceres me llevó de la mano a verlo como a un niño. Nunca voy a olvidar este viaje que recién comienza. 